good afternoon. The first session this afternoon has been given by Robin, Robin Sheet. He's talking about Catman doing elastic search in getting Coha search current. Robin. Cool. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm covering um, introducing a new sort of modern search system into Koha, and uh, there'll be more detail of that coming up. But first, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a Koha developer. That shouldn't be much of a surprise, given what I do. Um, I work at Catalyst IT, based in Wellington, which is the best city you should come visit. Um, and for a while now, I've been working on one big project, um, and that's what I'm going to be telling you, telling you about today. So to begin with, we've got Koha. Koha is a free library system. Um, library management system is its proper name. It doesn't deal with these. Um, instead, it deals with these. And this, just for trivia purposes, is the uh, Rijksmuseum library in Amsterdam, and it is actually a Koha library. And one of the library guys there is part of our QA team for Koha. Um, so a library management system. Um, you might be kind of wondering what it does. It does everything um, that a library needs. Um, there's a lot more things than you might think. So, you know, circulation. If you go to a library and you, um, you know, bring your pile of books up to the front and they scan them through with a barcode reader, that barcode reader is plugged into a computer that is running a web browser that is running Koha. Um, the cataloging, so if they get new records in, they need to enter them into the system so that people can find them. Um, reporting, libraries love their reports. They, uh, you know, if they're a small council library, they need to justify their existence to council. If they're a corporate library, they want to know how their staff are using the library. Um, many, many reports, they love their data. Um, just to skip towards the end, because there's a lot there, you know, we need to talk to RFID readers, and we need to talk to photocopiers to say, you know, you've got enough money in your account, things like that. Um, and of course, when you're lazy about bringing things up, they need to charge you money. But search was missing from that list. Um, search is possibly the most important thing. Um, it's how people actually use the library system. Um, most people just, you know, walk up, whether, whether they're in the physical building, they'll walk up to a terminal. If they're actually seeing it remotely online, they'll bring up the website, and they type into a box like Google. Um, these days, and I think it's a good thing, everybody expects to be able to just walk up, sort of sit down, and type words into a box, and have useful results come out. Um, so this is how most people interact with it. And um, the way Koha currently does it is using a system called Zebra. This has nothing to do with the routing thing, and this is actually its logo. Um, Zebra is a search engine for structured text data. And that's great, because library formats are very structured and very texty data. It's pretty speedy um, and lightweight. You could probably run it on a, a reasonably sized database on a Raspberry Pi, and it wouldn't break a sweat. Um, and uh, it responds very, very quickly um, and takes very little memory. Good searching is not a very quantitative thing, but you know, if you want something with a title that matches this and an author that matches that, unless the subject matches this, um, but you've got this bit in brackets and you want to end this thing and not that thing, it can do all that. Um, those are sort of you know, fancy Boolean searches that you're probably taught at school when they showed you how to use the library system that you've never looked at since. Um, and it supports library data formats very well. Um, more or less, you can get a Zebra installation, and with all the default stuff it comes with, and a bit of configuration on top, it'll just magically work. Lots of magic. Um, the flip side, it's getting a bit creaky, and that's kind of, you know, hard to, hard to sort of describe, but if you ever use it, you kind of feel like, well, it's working now, but if it kind of falls over, which it doesn't do very often, I don't really know where to go and what to do, and. Um, why it stopped working when this configuration file hasn't changed, but something else in the system's changed, and yeah, it just sort of has that feeling to it a little bit. Scaling is hard, and this is becoming more and more a problem as cloud-type environments happen. Um, we can horizontally scale out our web servers, you know, fire up five more web servers, but the traditional way of running Zebra is to have 
the Zebra server, search server running on your web server. But then now you've got five web servers and you can't do that because you've only got five indexes to keep in sync and that doesn't happen. Something gets out of sync. It's not very flexible. Um, if we need to make a change to our configuration, like say some standards change, because they always change, um, and we need to change how a certain field is indexed or something like that, we actually have to go and edit files under slash Etsy. Um, whereas these should be kind of application defined things, not sysadmin defined things. So kind of a bit of an aside, and I'm gonna try to keep this a bit short because I could literally fill an entire talk ranting about library data. Um, the main format that people use is called MARC, which stands for so machine readable cataloging. Um, got two kind of disk formats that you'll see around. Um, ISO 2709, which nobody ever refers to it as that, they just call it MARC, and MARC XML. Um, so MARC, when it was developed, was this big successful project to bring card catalogs into the 60s, and we're still using this today. Um, now, don't get me wrong, it did do a good job at bringing them into the 60s, but it was doing that in the 60s. Um, if you look at the, look at the on disk mark file, the first five bytes are the digits that spell out the length of the record. Um, the next lot of, the next sequence of bytes is a directory, so you can jump into the middle of the record. If you think about it, that's kind of weird, but if you think about it again, that's great if it's all on a tape drive. Um, you can, you know, scan to here, jump to this bit of the record, check if it's, oh, it's not the one I want, I know how exactly to scan to the next record, really fast. Um, nobody has tape drives these days for this sort of thing. Um, and if you've ever wondered what those, you know, um, record field, you know, end of record and end of field ASCII, uh, sort of the low bytes in ASCII are for, they're for this. Um, so yeah, it's getting a little aged. Um, and this is only the disk format. What the fields and subfields and everything actually mean aren't defined as part of the spec. Um, they're defined somewhere else. And this happens. Um, and where it says universal standard, there is actually one of these variants that tried to be a universal standard. So what we ended up with was Mark 21, which is uh, what most of the world uses these days. Um, was originally known as US Mark because it was what the US used, and it, they renamed it to be Mark for the 21st century, and also to let other countries, you know, kind of use it and not have to go, oh, we use the US version. They just use now they use the Mark 21 version, um, which is the, exactly the same thing. There's Unimark, which attempted to be the universal standard, and is used by the people that speak French, um, and I think some Italians. Nor Normark, which is used by the bits of the, bits of the world that speak Norwegian. Um, Canada mark, UK mark, Australia mark, Finland mark, Sweden mark, Russia mark, et cetera, et cetera. Um, many, many standards. This is just a small section of the list that I found. Um, fortunately, those, those last lots have mostly gone away and everybody's moved to mark 21, except the French and the Norwegians. Um, so if you haven't seen a mark record before, um, lucky you, but unlucky you now, this is what they look like when they're rendered into kind of a human readable form. You've got your numbers on the left that specify your fields, you've got your letters off to the side that specify your subfields, and if you've ever seen the matrix where you know, the guy's going, you know, the code's falling on the screen, he's going, all I see is like blonde and brunette and redhead. After a while of staring at this, you can kind of go, all I can see is title and author and subject field. Um, and then you go, oh, but hang on, that 245 is wrong because it needs to be split at the colon and moved into a B. And what was this person thinking when they did this? And I see he's uh, <laughs> had this problem before too. Um, so for example, just to give a bit of context, 100 is usually primary author, um, 245 is title, 245A is the first part of the title, 245B is the subtitle, 245C is what's called statement of responsibility, which is usually you know, edited by Joe Bloggs. And there's hundreds of these. This is a short record. Um, everyone in libraries pretty much uses and understands Mark. After a while, they kind of grow to like it. And I've got a theory about that. Um, so anyway, enough of that. I could go on forever. Um, and I'll try not to anymore. 
So back to the topic, Elasticsearch. Um, you may have been living under a rock for a while, but uh, it's, you know, for search. Um, in a nutshell, this is very much a small nutshell, JSON documents go in, search queries go in, JSON documents come out. Um, kind of what you want from a search engine. Um, actually, you want a little bit more, but we, this is an important set. And what it gives us over Zebra, um, or actually just what it gives us, to be fair, real-time indexing. So to add a record with Zebra, we need to, every five minutes, we have a cron job, and that cron job goes through, pulls out all the records that have been marked as modified, um, builds a little index of them, shadow index, it calls it, and then it merges it with the primary index. Um, this is part of There now, there we go. Sorry. Cool. So, um, yeah, where was I? So we have a cron job that goes every five minutes and, does, and merges back into the index. And this is kind of awkward and uncomfortable and involved when things don't work, you get stuff scattered throughout slash temp, um, and it makes a bit of a mess. Elasticsearch, on the other hand, we we don't even have to flag a record has changed. We just put a little hook in the bit that changes records and say, well, when you're done with this, shove it over here and it jabs it straight into Elasticsearch and a second later, everything's ready. It does faceting and sorting, which are just things that library systems need. Um, and I'll cover the, them in a little bit more detail later because they're not particularly straightforward, it turns out. It has a flexible data model. Um, so you can, while, um, Zebra is quite good at its structuredness. Elasticsearch, you can kind of configure it on the fly. You can, um, you know, kind of lay the data out as it suits your application. You're not sort of rigidly defined into the way the software expects you to work. And a big thing is it gives you horizontal scalability. So it's kind of elastic, one of Elasticsearch's defining features is that you can plug a uh, new server in, fire up Elasticsearch, tweak the config perhaps, and boom, it's part of your cluster. You don't really have to think about it. And if a server falls over, your application probably won't even blink. Um, it is kind of fun to fire up a laptop with Elasticsearch on it at a hack fest and uh, notice that it's gone and connected and become part of the cluster of all the other laptops running Elasticsearch. Um, that surprises people the first and second time they see it happen. And then you start looking at their data. Um, so Kathmandu which I think has a cool logo. Um, Kathmandu is a Perl data transmogrification library. Um, it does the kind of data warehouse style thing of extract data from over here, apply some transformations to it, and load it into this thing over there. Um, the imports has a complete alphabet soup. Um, you can import from CPAN, like CPAN, the index of things in CPAN, and probably the code too. Um, LDAP, you can import from Twitter. Um, the one I care about here is importing from Mark. But if you've been exposed to libraries before, half these acronyms you'll identify with. Um, it exports to caching layers, to database, to solar, to Mongo, to Elasticsearch. Um, so it's, pretty, it's a pretty versatile sort of thing. And the way we use it is we import, we fix, which is applying some fix rules um, that modify the data in the way we want, and then we export. Straightforward. Fix rules, here's just an example. This would actually be hundreds of lines long, um, but it takes you know, the 245 we saw earlier, and it moves it into title, and the, the 100 we saw earlier moves it into author. Um, the 020 becomes ISBN and so forth. Um, and that means we can then ask Elasticsearch, um, give me all the things that have an ISBN that matches this, and it's in the ISBN field, and we don't have to care that it's come from an O2OA field, whatever that means. So to kind of put this together, um, we have the actual project, which is making Koha use Kathmandu and Elasticsearch, um, and not Zebra. So 
a while back, some groups um, from various parts of the world decided they were willing to put you know, money together and sponsor development of this code um, or you know, of this implementation. And it went through a few people, but eventually it ended up on my lap to do the actual code writing. Um, and it's taken a while. It turned out to be a bit of a hairier project than anticipated, um, just because it's a 15-year-old code base. Libraries are very persnickety about how they uh, how their data is searched and and looked at and so forth. So, it turns out lots of little corner cases going on. So, there's kind of two aspects to how we do indexing. Well, how, how we work with the search engine. The first aspect is indexing, so getting the data in. This is really easy. We load a record, so it's been flagged as changed. We pull out pull out the mark record from the database. We apply our fixer rules, and then we include a form of the original mark record, and then we send it to Elasticsearch, and it's there. Um, we include the original record because when we do a search, we don't ever want to actually touch the, um, the database if we can avoid it, because we have all the data handy, so we just you know, pull the, the record out and then render it using XSLT or whatever you'd like. Um, and it just makes life easier and code faster. The hard part, or at least the, the complicated part, is doing the searching. We don't use Kathmandu for this. Um, we in theory could, but um, I just sort of looked at it and decided it's, a, it's another layer that we don't really need yet, so let's ignore it and it won't be too hard to put back in later if we need, do really need it. Um, so we speak Elasticsearch directly. And Elasticsearch is pretty nice to talk to once you've sort of got your head around it and read lots of documentation. So the kind of things that people will search for in a library system, it's like, you know, they'll type in Harry Potter or they'll type in J.K. Rowling. Um, or some people will get fancy and they'll type in like, um, let's move that mouse out of the way, you know, title with fish in it and author of London. Um, and you might even get people using the advanced search interface where they click on boxes and set in date ranges, but I doubt it. Um, so just to kind of go back a little bit, I talked about briefly, very, very briefly, about facets and search, uh, sorry, facets and sort. This is what they're looking at. Um, so facets, the bit on the left, let you refine your search. And you would have seen this in other applications as well. It's where, you know, say you do a search for fish and you've got one author who's written a lot of things about fish, their name will appear on the left-hand side. Um, and then you can click on that and it'll just give you things about fish by this person. Or maybe, you know, you're too lazy to walk across campus today and you just want to limit it to um, things in your nearby location. Um, you can do all that from here. And sort, you know, sorting is sorting. Normally you want to sort by relevance because that gets you the most relevant things. Um, but there's applications you might want to sort, sort, sort by author A to Z, or sort by author Z to A, or publication data, what have you. Um, this is the sort of thing that we need to be able to support, and support fairly well, because it's not simple. Um, so, yeah, that needs to work. And another catch is we need Zebra to keep on working too. Um, we can't just do a clean switch off because Koha is an open source project installed in thousands of libraries around the world. Um, some of these are hosted by companies like Catalyst and so on. And you know we've got technical people to do technical things with their systems. Others are literally single computers in third world countries with um, six hours of electricity a day. They don't have a technical department, they don't even have a technical person. Um, they just hope their computer doesn't break. Um, and, you know, every, every six months maybe, a volunteer might visit and, you know, make sure everything's happy. But that's kind of the, the best level technical support they get. They can't afford the time, the knowledge, the, the resource to, um, you know, build a little Elasticsearch cluster beside this. So we need to have both Elasticsearch and Zebra for, a, for quite some time in the future, running simultaneously. 
um, which means we need to switch between them. Um, now, Koha has hundreds, if not thousands, of system preferences built into it. Um, every library is its own sort of unique snowflake, and they want something or some combination of things that no other library in the world is doing. Um, so there's millions of knobs to, to switch. So I just added another one. That is you switch your search engine. Um, so I kind of did this just by using, actually I thought I'd remove that line, but anyway. Um, just some, so this is the, the search code as it was. And if it looks pretty ugly, it's because it is pretty ugly. Um, this is just a 15 year old code base. Things have evolved over time. Um, but it calls out directly to things like build query and get records that talk directly to Zebra. And that won't work for my cases. So I fixed it by adding a layer of indirection. And if anybody's done computer science, they know that the first way of fixing a problem is to add another layer of indirection. Um, but this actually does go a fair way to solving my problem. You'll notice that all the new functions are called um, something something underscore compat to just indicate that these are the old fashioned ones and really if you're doing something new, you should use the new ones. Um, but it means I can do an almost search and replace across the code base to get the new stuff working. You don't have to worry about this code. Um, so the query builder and searcher classes will switch between Zebra and Elasticsearch depending on what you've chosen. And then the only hard part is making sure they really are compatible. Um, and that took a fair chunk of reverse engineering because there was very little documentation internally. Um, Zebra version just thunked straight through to the previous code. The Elasticsearch version processes the arguments you, prov you provide and turns them into a Lucene style query, um, which is just a way of searching in Elasticsearch that means I can be lazy and I have to build a, a full search tree. Um, so this is what a uh, Elasticsearch query ends up looking like. So if you searched for title containing Harry Potter, um, it builds up at the top the, the list of facets um, that we want to get. So you know facets for subject and facets for author and there'll be more. Um, how we want to sort, in this case, by publication date. And our actual query, where we have, you know, open bracket, title, Harry Potter, close bracket. Um, you'll notice it says title, not TI. It's because, hyster hysterical reasons, there is um, sort of, Zebra kind of expects you to use one term and then it kind of changes it somewhere in the system to another term and I've just basically built up a table somewhere that replicates all this. Um, and it does it with a bunch of regular expressions. And I built this as kind of a stopgap, you know, it's, I'll come back to it and I'll do a proper parsing of the query and turn it into a nice tree, but it actually works reasonably well, um, which surprised me. It does get a few weird corner cases. Um, it's pretty easy to construct a search that'll cause it to, cause Elasticsearch to explode at you. Um, but I just catch the explosion and say, sorry, I didn't get that, please try again, or well, something along those lines. Um, it's not perfect. Um, and in an ideal world, we'd take, you know, say a search like this, turn it into a nice little tree structure, and you know, if you've got brackets and grouping and things, it'll go into subtrees. Um, and from there, we could convert it to any search language we wanted. Um, but that's gonna take a while. Uh, there's some people who have been staring at that, but haven't got very far yet. Um, but it's, it's part way there. I just need to badger them some more. Um, but that'll, give, that'll mean that the whole system becomes a whole lot more pluggable. Because if you have like an abstract syntax tree style search query, you can translate that into anything you want. So Elasticsearch backend and a, I don't know, a Google book search backend if that made any sense. So I've alluded a couple of times to the fact that there's some weird stuff that happens. Um, so to take an example of sorting, you know, you think it's easy, you have this field and you sort on this field. Um, but libraries aren't that simple. So if we take authors, I mean, what kind of authors can there possibly be? Surely it's just the guy that wrote the book. Well, this is just three of them. Um, the primary author, which is the person that wrote the book, mostly. Secondary authors, the ones that, you know, if you've got a list of names, the ones that aren't the first, li the first name. Um, you know, perhaps it's as, as, as the students of a supervisor or something like that. 
Um, statement of responsibility, which is, you know, short stories edited by Joe Bloggs. The edited by, including often the string edited by, uh, goes in that section. Um, if you sort by anything other than the first one, you get weird results. So say you've got a book that has the author Aaron and the secondary author Zardoz, um, and you sort by author A to Z, it'll come up near the top because of Aaron. If you sort Z to A, it'll come up near the top because of Zardoz, and that's pretty unintuitive. Um, so, we, but we also need to search on them. Um, because if we search for Zardoz, we still want this record to show up. So what I'm doing is adding some fields when everything gets converted into Elasticsearch that are called, you know, say, author underscore underscore sort. And just the stuff we want to sort on goes into them. We have the same thing with facets. Um, we want to create facets for our primary and secondary authors because that's what appears on the left, and secondary authors count enough to appear. But we don't want edited by to appear in the facets, because that's just ridiculous. So we do the same kind of thing. We make underscore, underscore facet fields. So that's kind of the overview of what the project is, why it's a bit weird in places. Um, and so now I'm just gonna have a quick look at where I hope to go in the future. Um, so Zebra is a search engine for structured text data. With Elasticsearch, so long as we can make JSON, we can put it in there. Um, and um, that gives us some benefits. So not everything in that we might want to use is Mark. Maybe some things are, I don't know, XML or um, Dublin Core or something else. Um, so maybe we want, to, we want to scrape in Project Gutenberg. We want to pull the website down and we want to add that to our index. And then whenever somebody clicks on a record, it takes them straight off to Project Gutenberg. Um, nice way for adding the classics to your library. Um, we could do that. We could have a little indexer that every day goes through Project Gutenberg and pulls out you know, its indexes, shoves them into ours, and then it's just part of the catalog. Or you could sign up with, say, EBSCO, who provides journals and like, you know, digital resources sort of stuff. Um, Every day they could push their index or their, their catalog into the index and your library system just shows it up. Um, that, this sort of thing is all possible using Elasticsearch and it's not really with JSON. Oh, sorry, with Zebra. Um, all you have to do is just make a mapping, one mapping, so we say this bit of this field goes into the author, this bit of the field goes into title, this other bit goes probably into author, and this other bit goes into author but in a slightly different way. Um, and then one for display so we can pull the records back out run them through XSLT, and have it draw it up nicely. Safe searches is a cool thing I think would be useful. Um, you can prepare a search, and you can save the search in Koha. And then, whenever something new that matches the search is added to the system, it'll ping you an email. Um, so it's kind of like the reverse of searching in a way. It's you put a search in and get notifications when something matches way in the future. Kind of like Google Alerts. Um, so you want to watch your favorite watch for your favorite author, get a notification whenever it happens. Or if you're say at a university or at a company um, or a research organization and you deal with a certain field of things, you can put a watch on subjects and automatically get emails for it. A cool thing I went to Elasticsearch uh, training course a while back, and a cool thing they mentioned there was tribe nodes. That's where you've got say say two or three Elasticsearch instances, or sorry, Elasticsearch clusters, um, you can have a tribe node that talks to all three of them, and if you do a search on that tribe node, it goes out on your behalf, searches each one of those other clusters, and merges the results together. Now, this could give you an overview of multiple catalogs. Um, it could, um, say you want to build a consortium, you've got two libraries in a geographically or um, specialization specific area, you could combine catalogs, but they still maintain their own sort of specific index. Um, these are the kind of things that I hope to see coming in with Elasticsearch once it's sort of firmly baked in. And it's things we just can't do with the current system. So the current state of the project is that 
it kind of feels like the first 90% is done. It's working, it's in there. There's bugs that need to be polished off. Um, there's, it's, it's pretty much almost feature complete with the existing search system, which is where I, which I was aiming for. I'm just hoping that you know there's not 90% left, um, but we want our software projects. So thanks for listening, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. We won't. We wouldn't. You wouldn't need to do a, um, a migration from Zebra to, to Elasticsearch. Um, sorry. The question is, if we switch from Zebra to Elasticsearch, how will the migration happen, um, and would we use Kathmandu? Um, so, the canonical source of data in a Koha system is the database. Um, so, it's common practice with Zebra. Whenever something's going a bit funky, the first thing you do is do a complete Zebra reindex from the database. Um, in most cases, for small to medium libraries, that might take an hour or two. For big libraries, you might be talking like half a day, which is downtime, which is bad. Um, but you know, half an hour out of hours is not, not such a problem. So the switchover would happen, and the way you do it would be you flick the switch, and it stops using Zebra, and um, then you uh, just do a, tell it to do a reindex with Elasticsearch, and it'll just push everything into there. Um, in theory, you could do a direct migration, but I think in practice it's probably more work than it's worth. How many libraries across how many countries use Koha? How many libraries across how many countries use Koha? Well, it's an open source project, so it's, there's no hard numbers, but we estimate, I think, every continent, and I can't remember if that includes Antarctica or not. Um, there might well be a research library there using it. I'm not 100% sure. Um, we guesstimate, I think, in the thousands of libraries, like the higher, like I don't think 10,000, but maybe 8,000, I think, um, across most countries. Um, it's quite big in developing countries. Um, a few years back, I flew to the Solomon Islands uh, to train them, the university, on how to sort of use and administer Koha. Um, and then we had visited their museum, which is using a little card catalog system. And I got an email sometime later saying that, you know, um, they were looking into Koha. And also at the same time, the uh, bunches of little community libraries had also had sort of joined onto the university system. Um, so developing countries, it's really popular. It's big in. Um, France, it's like the second most popular system across France. Um, it's getting quite big in the US. Um, it's growing slowly in New Zealand, and I'm not sure what Australia is like, but I think there's a fair bit here too. Um, so, yeah, hard numbers are hard to come by, but a lot and everywhere. Sweet, nothing else? Thanks very much.